Hello and welcome to Arn. This is Paul Bromwell and we are back. Here we are the beginning of November and I am once again by the Hall of Famer, Double A, Arn Anderson, my tag team partner. Arn, how are you this week, man? Well, I'm a little bit on pins and needles about the election. We, we're doing this election night. We are. and But you know what? And uh, Andrew Hermas, our great research guy, said to me, Paulie, you know this is the big night, right? And I said, Andrew, I think everybody is going to be just okay with taking an hour out of their day to think about something else <laughs> other than the election. And so we thought, let's put some smiles on faces and welcome everybody in to the virtual living room and, and talk about uh, and have some fun with our, our fans and our friends and talk a little wrestling. Yeah, because we're not going to know probably till tomorrow. Mm -hmm. You know who won anyway. So that's right. That's right. So so that's what we're here to do. We're here to have some fun and entertain, and uh, love seeing all of you already here viewing, already getting tons of questions in, some super chats already. So great to see so many of you. Michael Jensen already with a super chat. I'm going to start with it because Michael, before we get into uh, promoting and talking about what we're here to talk about. You shared something. I shared it with Arn already, and I know he wants to comment on it. I'm going to throw it up on the screen right now. Michael says, besides this, among the many podcasts I listen to is the Dutch Mantel podcast. The host of that show has come out saying that Dutch health is not well. Just getting some positive vibes out there for him. Arm, Michael goes on to say, Dutch has always spoken highly of you whenever um, your name's brought up on the show. But you said you had heard uh, some of this about Dutch, right? Yeah, I just pulled the clip up. I, it was the guy that she is the co-host of, yeah. of their podcast. And, you know, I got a lot of time for that guy, too. He's very fair in, in his judgments. And, you know, uh, Dutch has is, is always been a very intelligent guy where the business is concerned. Uh, he had a good background to start, you know, in Tennessee. And he's been around for, God, forever, probably going on 50 years. So he's got experience and, uh, you know, I, th I think this, uh, bad health thing has really gotten bad and he's been in and out of the hospital. I, I'm not sure if I, you know, can verify this, but I think the guy said that his wife as well had been in the hospital. So man, they're going through some, some tough times and, uh, Man, we need to all be praying for him. That's for sure. Yeah, pr definitely. Prayers, well wishes, good vibes, all that good stuff for Dutch and his wife, uh, for sure, if she's dealing with things as well. Um, man, no one likes to hear that. And you talk about a veteran, a legend uh, yes. in the business, Arn, and a great man, great guy, always speaks highly of you as well. So send in some prayers up definitely for Dutch. Michael, thank you for sharing that with us as well. Uh, I want to continue to mention too, Darth Payne, I see you here, Tim Angstam, Ryan. Happy birthday, Ryan. I know today is your birthday. I remember you saying that two weeks ago. Uh, CG's here, our buddy. So many are here already watching live. This is the virtual living room of Arn Anderson. Amy Vaughn is here, Arn. Uh, so many are here. Uh, it's just exciting to have so on, so many of you here. In typical fashion, though, Arm, before we get into a lot of your questions, which thank you so many of you for asking, don't forget to use Super Chat. Uh, we just wanted to share that about Dutch to get things going and then also talk a little about, bit about some of the things that are coming up on you, your calendar, Arn, and the family calendar as well, like we do traditionally here um, on the show. And uh, I know you're excited because you have Brock big show uh, tv taping this coming saturday we're going to throw it up on the screen for all of you to see but he's back doing his thing with mlw again this saturday in chicago yeah and what a great city and i mean they support every wrestling organization that comes there that chicago fans may be the very best on earth and they'll travel cicero's just on the edge of town anyway i don't I don't think it's that far from Chicago itself. So uh, the plans from talking to Brock are uh, just to keep more moving on forward and uh, letting those guys just get more and more experience as a team. And much appreciation to his partner, for sure, CW, who's doing a great job in grooming him. 
Yeah, for sure. They uh, just so that you're all aware too, you can follow MLW at their YouTube channel, and uh, they're going to be as p- a part of the TV taping portion portion of Lucha Apocalypto, Correct. and uh, that takes place this Saturday, November 9th. That event is sold out, Arn. Uh, but there was a clip that I I kind of took some notes on, and they talk about CW and Brock embodying the legacy of the Anderson family. Brock Anderson carrying on his family's story tradition continues to build his name with a blend of raw talent and undeniable drive. This is all from their website, man. It was so cool to read this. But they will showcase why they're one of the most feared forces in tag team. Their match will also be filmed exclusively for BN Sports to uh, air at a later date. Don't miss your chance to witness them, and you can check it out 10 Eastern on MLW's YouTube channel this Saturday night. So we want to do uh, talk a little bit about that and always want to be t- uh, here to support Brock and everything he's doing with CW. Um, my goodness, before we get too far, can we talk about the show that you just get, did in, uh, in in North Carolina, that throwdown in Tatertown, or uh, what was the name of that one? Where you They, they really got a hold of uh, who was it that they beat up? I was just, I had that in my notes too, but they kicked uh, they kicked some butt up there too of the, the Dawson brothers, sent them to the hospi- hospital. Yeah, uh, I think Brock is figuring out, you know, it, it's great to be a great wrestler. Sometimes you got to turn up the volume and you got to be a great brawler. And those guys outweigh Brock and his partner. They're much, much bigger. They've been together forever. They're a seasoned team. So sometimes you got to take a few shortcuts and that's all part of the business. I think you're going to probably see the rematch for that wrestle Cade weekend. Uh, if you're not doing anything or don't have plans or need something to do, get to wrestle Cade the weekend after Thanksgiving. Uh, you don't want to miss it. Winston Salem, North Carolina, Arn, you're going to be there. Brock will be there. So many people are going to be there. Arn, it's a who's who list of talent that'll be down at wrestle Cade. And I know that AML is going to be hosting the show. Uh, check out AML's Facebook page, by the way. You will see the beatdown that Brock and CW gave uh, to Zane Dawson. And it is like, it, it is four horsemen all over again, I'm telling you, uh, that sends them to the hospital. But I have a feeling that the Muppets is going gonna, is gonna to happen at WrestleCade. Go ahead. And, well, let me, say, let me just say that uh, I decided to uh, interject myself. Here he goes. And how in God's name would I have known who came to foil me? I guess that's the right word. Foil the intervention. Ricky Steamboat. So I didn't see that part of the clip. So he gets involved, huh? He lit me up out there on the floor and prevented me from doing anything else. I just, I don't know why he got upset. All I did was trip George. You know, George South. George South. Of course, he is beloved and was fixing to win with the sleeper. So I just did what I do and interjected myself. And uh, Ricky decided he would interject himself. What a reaction he got. And and justly so. He's a legend. So when, you, that, say that he don't cover him, when you say he interjected himself, did he throw the old chop your way? Or oh, yes. A couple of them. Nice. Only thing kept me from going down was my ass was against the apron. So, oh man, thank they God for aprons. Shops. And I bet they feel just like they did back in the day, too. He can, uh, he can uh, still do, I'm sure he can still do anything he chose to do and make it look 100% like he used to. That, that's that's awesome. just how talented he is. Man, see, look at the good stuff. These folks are still getting coming to these shows. They're seeing legends, not not just the up-and-comers, the future of the business, but you're seeing Steamboat chopping the enforcer. It doesn't get any better than that or entertaining. And, After you get involved with George South. Well, AML's got a great fan base, you know, and it's a lot of the same fans. I'm starting to recognize faces now that we've been okay. working with them for a while and just they're so valuable in the fact that, you know, they're getting their money's worth and they follow the stories and, you know, they have a great time. It's a family atmosphere. The, the promotion itself has, I couldn't be happier with how they treat us and uh, they're much appreciated. That's for sure. 
Good stuff. All right, let's keep going because we have a lot to cover for June 95. I wanted to talk about the retro uh, toy convention. That's coming to Greenville, South Carolina. That's prior to Russell Cade, November 22nd to 24th. Arn, I know you're excited about going to Greenville, South Carolina. You're taking the family with you, and uh, it should be a huge event for you and Brock. Smokey's making the trip too. So we got the whole crew going, and Greenville is like, one of Aaron's favorite places just to go down and walk around. It's such an eclectic city. What it's become is just some cool shops and cool restaurants and the downtown areas. I mean, it's become a, a destination for people that all over the Southeast, I think. So that'll be great. Be a good time. If you're in the area, even if you're not in the area, make it a trip prior to Thanksgiving, November 22nd through 24th. Come see Arn, come see Brock, uh, and I have a feeling there's going to be a lot of great guests and other things to do there. It's a toy, co it's a, it's a toy con, so Arn, a lot of stuff going on at these conventions, isn't there? Get that new uh, action figure out there for anyone that's been wanting it. It hasn't been out very long, so have plenty of those. Those will be available since it is a toy con. Have some, book, we'll have some books. We have some books. Let's talk about the comic book. I'm sure you'll have some in hand. Photos, pictures, you name it. It'll, you name uh, it, Arn's got it. Hats, T-shirts, all those that, you know, you can't, you know, figure out like me how to work the internet and order them that way. They'll <laughs> be right there sitting on the desk in front of you. So if you do know how to work the internet, great, great plug there, Arn. You can find a shirt just like I'm wearing right here at onetruesport.com. Guys, I love this. The Four Horsemen, Arn Anderson. You got the logos, the Horseman logo right here, matches the hat. Uh, so you can look Four Horsemen sharp, crisp, and top-of-the-line merchandise. Don't forget those jackets right behind me. Uh, our listeners have gotten their Doug Halliday Four Horsemen shirts that he did for them. Arn, uh, they're beautiful shirts as well check it out one true sport.com uh with all that said though arn i think it's time to talk a little bit more about the show we have a few more things to plug but i want to get into this week's episode i want you guys to fire in your comments i see we got super chats rolling in i promise we will we will get to your super chats but arn is it okay if we start with uh june 1995 a little bit yeah buddy all right let's do it guys throw the questions in i'll get to them as we run through and uh, if you remember, the last time we got together, we were talking all things May 1995. And as a reminder, that pay-per-view ended with Arn Anderson Tay and Ric Flair delivering the beatdown of a lifetime, not just to the Macho Man, but to the Macho Man's father, Angelo Poffo. Uh, Arn, after Hogan and Savage had defeated Flair and Vader in this tag team match, Renegade and you were the enforcers down along the sidelines there. You were outside of the ring. But you jump in and you start kicking the shit out of Angelo Poffo. Arn, I got to ask you, any uh, memories working with Angelo during this time? Any conversations, anything that you can recall uh, from this time spent during this kind of feud that he was involved with with the Macho Man? <sighs> For some reason, I can't remember that. Okay. Have you seen I, any footage? I remember watching you kick the shit out of him yesterday when I watched the bash. They showed the recap of what the pay-per-view before, and I'm like, well, there he sure is. Flair's got him down, and Arn's delivering the boots to Angelo Poffo. Couldn't happen to a nicer guy. <laughs> no, no, uh, he, was a, he was a generation ahead of me, and... You know, obviously, he's responsible for giving the wrestling world the macho man, Randy Savage, mm -hmm. which was huge. And, and Lanny Poffo. As yeah. well as Ta Lanny Poffo as well. Yeah. So, you know, generations passing down the business is uh, always a good thing. But if he chose to get in our business in those days, you know what the answer was. Yeah. Yeah, so, so that's kind of going on, leading us into June. Vader and Hogan are still kind of in the top line creative, uh, but they're not going to be on Great American Bash. The pivot was to Savage, to focus on Savage and Flair. They're having a red-hot feud. It's all over TV the month of June, and uh, they've had good matches in the past, so it's going to be red-hot. And we're going to talk about this month, you taking on the Renegade for the television championship 
Oh boy, I can't wait to talk to you about that. We're going to talk about Meng and Sting wrestling in the finals of the U.S. title tournament. So lots going on this month. I wanted to start with something that's been bugging me a little bit, Arn, and that is the whole Vader and Hogan not being a part of the pay-per-view. So during the buildup of this whole event, we've still got Vader and Hogan all over TV, Arn, but then bam, they're kept off the pay-per-view. These guys are headlining the last few events. So they headline Super Brawl, Uncensored, Slamboree. So in your mind, was it the right call? I mean, were they giving fans a little bit of a, of a breather? We would see them the next month. We'll see them in July. But do you, do, you, do you feel like it's okay to maybe keep them off pay-per-view for a month and focus on another feud like a Flair or Savage? What's your take on that? Do you continue a red-hot feud like that pay-per-view to pay-per-view, or is it okay to give it a month off? Well, let me ask you this. Building was sold out. I assume it was Dayton was sold out. It is a smaller venue, mm -hmm. which means you could give a couple of your top stars the night off and give them a little rest, give them a little break. As long as you still fill up the arena, which is going to be very important when you have those feature shows, you got to fill the building up so that the people that are there look around and they go, Hey, it's just shoulder to shoulder. Every seat is taken. I made the right decision because if you're in a 20,000 seat arena, say, let's just say that, and you paid premium prices and you go there and there's 3,000 people there, you start looking around going, well, how do I feel about it? Am I the only dummy that wanted to come see this? You know what I mean? You almost brainwash yourself. Sure. So if it was packed, Dayton's a good wrestling town, a great wrestling town, and I don't think it's a bad thing to rest some of your top guys. And it's not like they totally ignored him on the pay-per-view. Bachwinkle does come out and make they make sure they make it clear, hey, next month, Bash at the Beach, it's going to be Vader Hogan in a in a you know a massive main event steel cage, you know, matchup. So it's not like they completely ignored them. They just chose to focus on some other again, we're talking Flair Savage. Those two, uh, you know, back in these days, they can main event any pay per view and be and be okay. You still have Sting in his prime, Surfer Sting, uh, and so you still have plenty of top talent. To your point, it sold out the building. Yes, and it, that's a couple of main event main events. Sure. So you're all right there, I think. Yeah, let's talk about uh, Flair and Savage a little bit because right on cue, we see that shift to Flair and Savage. Do you think those two had enough built up tension? to sell a pay-per-view main event. And I feel kind of awkward even asking that question because to your point, they sold out the building. So I star, guess star power question, star power. Yeah. You know, you don't have to have a angle for every match, but you, if you're going to have star power, it better be star power. And, and you know what? Flair, in, in the uh, pre-show interview, brings up Elizabeth. He, he brings up the 1992 story with Elizabeth. It added some depth, even if it was from WWF. Wrestling fans know that story. It gave them a hook. I mean, there's a risk because you're bringing up a cross-reference. Flair brings up a line about 92 when I you know took your woman, referring to Elizabeth. That happened in the WWF. But do uh, you think that's a good move? You think, hey, and even back in those days still, wrestling fans were smartened up to know what he was talking about? Well, you couldn't very well. You could allude to the angle, but you can't say WWF. Right. So that's how they covered their ass. And I think everybody remembered the Elizabeth angle. So they got away with one. Yeah. So, so you're, you're totally fine with that whole concept. Yeah. 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 I don't think so. I'm going to talk a little bit about Savage and his protectiveness of his family. We've all heard stories about how protective he was of, of, of them. What about Angelo Papo? I know you said you don't necessarily remember a whole lot about him. Do you remember or recall Randy ever having any kind of sentiments or thoughts about his dad getting involved? We know how protective he was of Elizabeth. Do you recall him being yeah. all let me, all? Let me yeah. tell you something. When Randy Savage heard the old man was going to get a payoff, <laughs> And save every penny of it. <laughs> I'm sure he went berserk in a good way. Uh, 
you know, uh, and Angelo Papo was a guy that I think had a record for setups or push-ups or some some ridiculous thing, thousand yes. somethings. So yeah. I'm sure he was in better shape than a lot of the guys in the locker room, even though he was up in age. So Randy wouldn't have been worried about him getting hurt. And if it was, you know, myself and whoever that was that was going to be attacking the guy, we're not going to make sure that he doesn't get crippled or anything of that nature. Um, but I can assure you the first thing, because let me tell you something, Randy Savage was as tight and Poffo was as tight as anybody on earth. They got it from their dad. He started off, and I mean tight, tight. Save your money became a different line when you're talking about those guys. Well, too, I think it's kind of cool as a fan because, you know, Angelo Poffo never mentioned it all and with Randy and WWF. Now we as fans get an opportunity to be educated about who Angelo Poffo is. He's Randy's dad. He was a wrestler. You know, his background. All of a sudden, as a fan, I'm to- now I'm getting educated about Randy's wrestling lineage, unlike I ever was in the WWF. Well, yeah, and, that you know, in those days that, it- the only news you got or the only people you knew were the ones in the territory where you lived. You know, there wasn't, you know, going to WWF or WCW or whatever. I mean, it was back in those days, Poffo was a Kentucky, Tennessee area celebrity yes. and you didn't know about him That's until right. this Not happened. Nationally. Yeah. So it was, great sure. inf- well, it was just a great information source. You know, you found out something you didn't know. It's that. It also brings a personal element to the story, which is always, always going to make it you more, you know, bring in the emotion, help sure. the storytelling. So I like the creative for it. And I'm, and I'm glad to hear that Randy was all in for his dad. And uh, we'll, we'll hear how the kind of the match ends up with flair and randy before we talk about the renegade debacle because that's where i want to go next i want to take a pause here and i want to get to one of our super chats arns and i'm going to start with tim angstam tim uh first of all thank you for being here buddy he said when did you know you were going to be dropping the title to renegade and at what point did you know that the match was the shits (laughs) well let's cover that after first. we talk about it or as soon as the bell rung i knew it was going to be the shits <laughs> all day long i knew it was going to be the shits i think i found out a few days later and i knew then it was going to be the shits i just didn't know that we were going to put our fans through a horrifying what was it eight or nine minute nine minute nine minutes worth of shits he could have beat me in two minutes and everybody would have been much happier. I'm sure. Uh, the guy was just, it wasn't his fault. He was just green. And I mean, really green. And he had came in under false pretenses. Now he's stuck without the gimmick. He's just kind of left out there to dry. You know what I mean? He's not the ultimate warrior, but he was tripped. I guess he, was tripping the audience up by the the way he was featured to begin with. You know, if you go back and first time he was on TV, he was behind a, a curtain and all you could see was like, I mean, from the shape and size of him and the hair oh, yeah. that he was shaking, uh, just shape. one look, you might have yeah. thought, well, shit, maybe they do have the yeah. ultimate warrior. But once you find out it's not him, and then, you know, wrestling fans don't like to get swerved in a bad way. Uh, when you found out it wasn't him and that's who he was, and then he had to start having matches because he's not the ultimate warrior. It's like, oh, we might have thrown a wrench in this kid. And and here's the thing. They can talk all they want about fake Razor and Diesel, which would happen if, you know, whatever. This was where it started, the shitty gimmick thing. Like, let's bring in a fake a guy and be a fake, except for the name, right? He might as well have been called the ultimate war. It was unbelievable. They pushed him right to the moon. We're going to talk about it. He wins your TV title here in nine minutes that felt like 90 minutes. You're calling the match. I'm, I watched the match yesterday. I watched the whole, I watched the Great American Bash yesterday. And Arn, I'm sitting there and I'm like, uh, I know you so well. I can almost know what's going through your mind because I can see 
you know, you call in spots, him throwing them up, and you're still you cleaning it up. And I'm just thinking, oh, this has got to be so bad. When you're inexperienced and you're green, you can't fix it. Mm. Even though you're a veteran, you know, you can be know your craft and, and know how to ma have a match virtually with anybody. But when a guy is that green, it's hard to fix. And as it turned out, you know, I would have been correct. It would have been a lot easier on the eyes for our fans. If you're going to put him out there as a road, not a road warrior, but ultimate warrior clone. Ripple. Yeah. He should have won like the ultimate warrior. That's I mean, so it, true. Yeah. Minute and a half, two minutes. Yeah. yeah. Everyone would have been much happier. We'll I do. The I would. I would have. You have a story, and we'll talk about that after we do the review. Let's knock out a few more super chats. Albert uh, says, "Just stopped uh, here. Let's throw it on the screen. Just stopped by to say hi and wish you well. And I can't wait until Arn runs into William Defoe at a convention. Remember, Bromwell, the privilege was all yours." <laughs> Albert, we love you. Thank you. Uh, he's talking about the uh, Spine Buster in the Spider-Man movie with William Defoe. Good call back there. Albert, thank you so much for the super chat. Let's go next to Darren Staley, who says, Darren, in two hours, I will either be a North Carolina state senator or not. I'm running to be a public servant for all people in the state, regardless of party. Darren, as an elected official, Arn, is there anything out other than that that scares the shit out of you other than that tonight? Hearing Darren Staley as an elected official. Does anybody involved in that process know about this? <laughs> I don't think his voters have watched our past shows. Did you, I, it, Darren, it did you get it out there? Did you get enough coverage that we should all know about this? Because for some reason, I am not up to snuff on this. Particular He's been thing. interviewed by the Wall Street Journal. Darren's been out there. Yeah. Think he could win it? Uh, he is a good a shot. He has, he, has done, he has done some good work, for sure. He's kept me abreast. Wrong word with that guy. But he has kept me up to date with how he's been doing on the campaign trail. And he's really been working hard, a good platform. And and Darren, we wish you nothing but but the best. We just hope they haven't watched past episodes of you and your super chats. Well, shit, go get it then. What the hell? There you go. There you I'm go. sure well, you can luck, do buddy. it. Do as good as as a lot of them. There you go. Why not? And he's a common man with common goals that wants to bring people together. He's the son of a plumber. I'm kidding. But no, he's a good dude. And uh, I watched a video he put together. It was first class top notch. So, Darren, we wish you nothing. Go on successful. with it, Darren. Shit. There you go. All right. Albert's back. We have one more super chat and then we'll keep going. Put Miss Elizabeth in the Hall of Fame, Triple H. He wants to see Miss Elizabeth in the Hall of Fame. Miss Elizabeth R is iconic. Especially yes, she for, is. I mean, she is. She is I wasn't just, aware she wasn't in the She's Hall of not, Fame. but man, she is an icon for sure in wrestling. Lord. That's one that, that when did Randy go in? What year? Oh man, I I would I would have to look that up for sure. I don't I don't well, even that's know. one you that that you should have agreed to disagree about whatever happened in their personal life, they should have been put in together. Oh that's, yeah. That's how they will always be known. By he, most, my yeah. most fans. He was a uh, WWE hall of fame induction following in 2015. That's what, that was a quick Google search 2015. Okay. I don't know. I just think that when you have somebody that, you know, closely knit together and known as being, an entity together, they should have went in together. Maybe Amy says, do you think, uh, do you think this, it is a family reason that she isn't in the hall of fame, Amy, I have no idea, but it, there's, there's something there. That's for sure. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Um, Andrew said, Arn's right, put them in together. So, uh, so yeah, a lot of people feel that way about Miss Elizabeth for sure. Uh, Arn, I got to I got to meet her once as I was one of those fans that went to a hotel after a nitro in Philadelphia and got to see a lot of you guys. And she was the sweetest pie to me. Very she's nice. a nice lady. 
always, yeah. always was a nice lady. Very friendly. And I was just some dumb fan. Not that that's changed at all over the years, but um, very kind. I never forget that. You remember the kind wrestlers and you remember the ones that are like jerks and she was sweet just like she was on TV. So with that, let's continue. We'll talk a little bit more about this renegade debacle. And uh, you had, as we said, the honor of wrestling him. They pushed him as the warrior. He had zero experience. Um, he's thrown into the deep end, though, without the right buildup. He doesn't have the skill sets. Uh, anything else that you want to share? I, I think this is the time for you just to talk about what happened. You lose the match. First of all, let's talk about it. You're climbing the top rope, Arn. You're getting ready to do one of your classic top rope maneuvers, and I say that tongue-in-cheek because I love you. He kicks your feet out from under you. He throws you on the back of his shoulders. He does the old backdrop. You're flat on the mat. Takes his time. He's not moving quick. Goes over, gives you the big splash. Counts one, two, three. Pyro goes off all throughout the arena as he wins the championship. They do a camera cut to Paul White, who's standing in the crowd. So it's kind of a quick transition. They start talking about him as the big man, and he looks familiar because, remember, they're going to sell him as Andre's kid. Hmm. But then you are getting yourself together, and you make your way down the aisle. Now, they don't show this part, but you walk through the curtain, and I want you to tell the fans what happens as you walk through the curtain. <clears throat> there was a group of talent that worked for WCW that were worker workers. I'm talking the Steve Austins, the Bobby Eatons, the Zabiscos. Uh, I consider myself part of that group of the guys that could make a match with anybody. Paul Orndorff certainly fit in that group. So he knew, I'm sure, as he was sitting in the back watching that match and as it went past three minutes and four minutes and five minutes, Six minutes. <laughs> it had to seem like an eternity. And when I came through the curtain, I just, he was right there blocking my exit. Holy shit. He called me Arnie. Arnie, that was the shits. <laughs> I said, you have no idea. Now there's it. a part two to that, which we'll just save for next week. But that was nice to be greeted from one of your constituents that you respect a lot to let you know just how bad it was. Like I had to be told guys, the part two will deliver in our first episode in December when we cover July and I'll throw out a little, a little bait because guess who renegade fights in July at the pay-per-view Paul Orndorff. And that's where I'm going to leave it. We'll have a little fun there. So Paul Orndorff greets you, says it's the shit. He agrees with all of us. Guys, just go back and watch that match. It's on Peacock. Watch Arn, knowing what you know now, having listened to him talk about that nine minutes of his life that he'll never get back, and how that right after that, he walks straight back, and he said, Arnie, that was the shits. And, and Arn said pretty much he knew it was the shits. But... uh Arm, do you remember any conversation before going out? Like, buddy, you're going to go out there and it, you're going to give a match that's going to feel like an hour Broadway, and it's only going to, but it's going to be nine minutes with the Renegade. You're going to drop the belt. Do you remember any of that conversation? No, I just, uh, I just thought to myself, one of the only times I consider myself a veteran, I consider myself that's, yeah. able to pre prepare for anybody on any night and go out and make it passable. And I did not have that confidence going through the curtain on the way out this time. I just, I just knew, that, you know, Hey, I consider myself pretty good. I'm not that good. So Arn, would you say this is one of the probably count on one hand, how many times you've actually felt that, that way going to the ring? That's the only one that I really, yeah. I'm sure there's a couple more, but that's the only one I can think of that I just knew he did not have the tools in his tool belt to let me assist him along the way into having this something that the fans are going to buy because there was a few that reacted for him, but by and large, it was lopsided like, oh, shit. 
Now, when he came out, the reaction is not good. When Arn came out, there are fans for Arn. When he wins the title, there's a pop because the title change creates a pop. They did pop. Yes. They did the, the pyro. But you will notice that at the beginning of the match for sure. Arn now is just as good as time as any to interrupt this week's program to show you the artwork that our friend Marcus D'Angelo decided to do for this episode. Uh, the episode's titled Savage Intentions, obviously, because of what's going on with Randy. But there it is. It's you and the renegade kind of. We went after that great American bash feel Marcus did from the old flair artwork. What do you think of that artwork? There you are, the great American bash, kind of that declaration of independence, savage intentions, but Renegade is over your shoulder. You like that? He sure has got a big old head. <laughs> I love that's the first thing that you said. And that, some white teeth. He does. He's got a big old grill, big old Roman Reigns <laughs> teeth there. And uh, Arn, you're looking just as mean and nasty as they just told you you had to drop that title again. So there you are. That's the I, art I, I was just thinking to myself, oh, why me? <laughs> that's the why me face. <laughs> I have done everything that's ever been asked of me without ever saying no one time. Why me? The one time you wanted to say no. Yeah. And Hey, I wanted to get him over strong. Yeah. There was no there was no ill intentions on my part. It was nothing but positive intentions. Speaking of Marcus D'Angelo, I think now it's as good a time as any. We'll take a real quick commercial break to talk about him as a wrestler, Arn. You've heard that and you got to watch his match. He sent it to me, yes. Marcus is a wrestler, guys. I don't know if you've seen it. He's cutting promos. His promos have been killer. He's getting dirty in the ring, guys. I want to make sure you're aware he's wrestling for International Wrestling Cartel. Britt Baker, Wardlow, several others have wrestled for this company in Pittsburgh. Saturday, December 7th, 2024, Mark's Court Time, Elizabeth PA. Marcus D'Angelo, our guy, does the artwork. A lot of work for Arn, uh, social media wise. Arn, you said I want to put this over on my show. Marcus D'Angelo going to be in action on December the seventh, and you can watch it on Triller. You know, I've worked for that promotion myself. Been a while back, um, and uh, they run a nice show. And Mark to give Marcus an opportunity and a platform. You know, he hasn't been trained in very long, guys, and as we know. The ability to do this well, really well, it, it is a it's a it's a time consumer. You know, it's it's months, if not years, and he is coming along He's with his fundamentals, and we're just happy for him because if it ended tomorrow, and I, I've told him this too, I said, you know, if this thing ended tomorrow for you, let's just put it to you this way. You will have had more days doing something you love than 99% of the people in America. So true. On their job. So, man, just soak it up, enjoy it, love every minute of it, and uh, welcome. He's He's been training his ass off, promos good, put, getting his body in shape, working out, looks great, cutting some really good promos. He, he, He's the podcaster. That's, you know, that's who he is on the show, backstage correspondent. He's got the loaded glove from Ted DiBiase and uh, really proud of him. And uh, we said, man, we would love to make sure that folks know where they can catch you on Triller. So make sure you check it out December the 7th, big show. And uh, man, Marcus, uh, we're going to make sure we promote it again at the end of the month uh, for you as well, our next show. But wanted to just quickly uh, share that with our audience. So proud of him and what he's doing, Arn, aren't we? One word of advice. If Teddy truly gave you that glove, do not smell it. <laughs> oh, it has never been washed. I oh. sure. It was his rib on the wrestling world. That's enough to not want to have to wrestle, Marcus. The smelly glove. Could be a finish in itself. Right. Just stick it in their nostrils. Yeah. Vader style. Okay. There, there you go. I was just, yeah. just sharing that with any would be opponents slash victims. There you go. Well, guys, keep the super chats coming. I see plenty of them coming in. We're going to continue on with the story of June, 1995. Arn, let's talk a little bit about the dungeon of doom era. 
Uh, you're a straight shooter. That's all you've always been known as. But you got to tell me, what did you make of the whole Dungeon of Doom storyline? We went WCW. It seems goes from these serious, credible heels to now full-on cartoon villains. What's going on here? Well, you got to look at what was Hogan known for: the Monster Killer. Yeah, that old era style. Those big monsters. Yep. Well. You know, once those guys, you know, once you had ran through them, then a guy that looks like some of those guys, you know, they were monsters. I mean, they had a couple of guys that were world class, you know, uh, weightlifters and all kind of just monsters that went into that group of Sullivans. But they were just there to be groomed and fed to Hulk. That was their job. Vader was a potential dungeon member and that seemed to be pushing it, but Hey, it's wrestling. Things get weird sometimes, but let's talk about the the members. You have the Ugandan giant Kamala. You got John Tenta. He's portraying the shark. He's worked with Hogan. All right. And WWF, yep. you got the Zodiac man who was formerly known as Brutus, the barber beefcake. All these men make their debuts in the following months as the faction under their direction of one of our dear friends, the taskmaster, and they're all targeting Hulk. As I said, Vader actually flirted with the notion of joining the dungeon. He confronted uh, King Curtis and Sullivan at one point in the dungeon. But uh, Vader, he's chosen, he's the one. He's the one that they want to have end Hulkamania. And he needed to prove himself on the Roadkill Tour, which essentially was a series of matches where Vader ate up enhancement talent on his way to facing Hogan at the Bash at the Beach pay-per-view in July, which we're going we're gonna to talk about next month. But Dungeon of Doom, um, again, it was, if you ever have the chance, if you're a member over at Ad Free Shows, get to listen to uh, some of the old uh, Tuesdays with the Taskmaster shows. I know they're in the archives. You get to hear a lot of fun stories from Kevin Sullivan about that group. Uh, you know, crazy cartoonish gimmick. But, uh, you know, again, they were those monsters, to your point, Arn, that they wanted to line up. Hogan was comfortable working with them. It was cartoonish, but it worked for this era. And uh, it just felt like a kind of a change for WCW because WCW had always been known as uh, having more of those straight shooter style, if you will, villains. Well, and Hulk was a monster killer. That's That was his job. He was a dragon slayer. In our business, you have dragons and you have dragon slayers. That's what Hulk was. He was for sure, so it worked right for him. I want to talk about, as we continue to move on down the storylines, we're getting to the Great American Bash. There was a New Japan tour that happened in June. June's one hell of a busy month. And uh, you wrestle in Tokyo, Arn, four days before the Great American Bash. That That's a hell of a road trip. And it's you and Austin on this tour. But guys like Flair, Savage, Hogan, they all stayed back. Um, and I think if, if memory serves me correct, Japanese, they like that hard hitting, they like the technical wrestlers. So it's a natural fit to your point earlier, when you were talking about guys like Austin Malenko, Eddie Guerrero, because, you know, new Japan, WCW, the relationships healing. And it seems to me, and I want, I don't want to see if you agree with this, maybe Japan's more looking for those gritty style, not the flash of Hogan. Would I be wrong in saying that? They want guys that have their finish over, that have, you don't prostitute your finish. It was the first time I ever saw a baby face who was put in a submission hole, and it was like uh, Hase and, oh, God, what was the heel? Had that great look. Um, handlebar mustache. Uh, dark uh, hair with spikes straight up yeah um oh it's chono chono yep masu masu here chono masu right? chono yeah yeah he uh tremendous worker he had i want to say hase who was the top baby face over there in a submission hold like a it was like a cena's submission hold and Actually, I think we I stole it from him and gave it to John. Okay. But he got to the ropes to save himself. He didn't wrestle himself out, Hase. Now, in American style, baby faces don't save themselves by grabbing the bottom rope. But 
that group of fans in Japan have been conditioned that that's smart. You saved yourself. You would have gotten beat if you hadn't did that. And they appreciated it and they popped huge for the baby face saving themselves. So you go over there to answer your question. Yes, they liked wrestling. They liked strategic wrestling. They liked selling each other's stuff properly without throwing stuff away. It, uh, that part of it was a great experience to go and see that. It was a long way to go in four days round trip. For sure, Arm. But this one is a big one. And this is a big one historically because you wrestled one night on this tour with Steve Austin and Mike Enos in a six-man tag match. This is June 14th, 1995. This is four days before the Great American Bash. Arn, this is the match where Steve Austin tore his triceps. This eventually leads to his firing from WCW in September of 1995. Do you remember him tearing his tricep in that match or recall him being injured in that match at all? I do, and he tried to wrestle with it. You know, with the injury, I remember that. Uh, thank God it was a six man, so we could cover for him. Um, but it was, if you look back at the tra trajectory of that injury and what happened career wise after that, man, that's one of those huge, which I'm a fan of, what ifs. <laughs> that's exactly where I was going, man. The what if. If Austin doesn't get hurt, Stays with WCW. What? What could? What? I mean, he leaves. He goes to ECW. He gets fired September. Goes to ECW, cuts you know some crazy promos, ends up going to WWF. Would we have ever seen Stone Cold Steve Austin? The Attitude Era. Well, I mean, what does that look like if Austin doesn't tear the tricep? What if? Who, who knows? If you know, had that not happened, I'm sure he would have stayed and had a much, much longer career with WCW because, you know, he could already tear it up. He was already a seasoned hand. And uh, that's just, that's a huge what if. Really is. Who knows? Can you recall back in those days, an uninjured Austin? Was he a favorite of the office at, at, for WCW? Was he a guy that they that you recall that they looked like, hey, even though Hogan's in the limelight, Sting, as we're going to talk about, becomes the U.S. champ, there's still money to be made with Stone Cold. Was that the feeling that you can recall back well, then in WCW? I remember the feeling I had. There was a lot more uh, in the tank with him and Pillman as partners. I think that got shut down way sooner yeah. than it had to. Those guys were really, they really came together. and They were a fun team to watch. They were heat getters. That could have went on for, for another year. Yep. The Hollywood uh, yeah. Blonde. Yes, so, absolutely. Yeah. Well, what a time, Arn. And you're a part of it all. It's, it's so interesting as we go through your career to see the thread of Arn Anderson throughout so many of these big-time situations. You're sitting here talking about the, you know, the STF and how, you know, uh, Chono and how you talked to John Cena about using that move. Um, incredible. You're, you're, it's not just what you're involved in from a talent perspective or matches you're involved with or working with Austin the night he gets hurt. Also, oh, yeah, that was the move that I became familiar with there. That then when I produced John Cena, I was like, hey, you should start thinking about using it's just more examples of how the impact that you've made on the business. And I always find it so fascinating. Well, I was just fortunate and it was not lost on me how fortunate I was that when I had my surgery and I found out I could never wrestle again, um, that I had that knack of helping talent progress. I can mm. tell them what not to do and here in my estimation, why or what to do. And here's why. And being able to help groom those, those kids, you know, it's, it's a legacy. I hope I leave behind when it's all said and done that, that I uh, influenced, you know, some careers that went on to be the best this business has ever seen, or maybe ever will see. 
so so well said arn and, and for sure for um it, you have and you and you hear it again and again whether i've heard you on busted open and i hear nick you know nemeth talk about you or other wrestlers just talk about the influence that you've had on so many um and, but again here we are going through your story we're hearing about you wrestling with austin the night he gets hurt which then results in his termination which then results in you know, all these different steps, the time that you worked with him in Dangerous Alliance, and then, oh, by you're in Japan, you're seeing this move, and you're thinking, this is going to be great to coach a, you know, a one-day superstar in John Cena, who, oh, by the way, 2025 is going to be the year of John Cena in the WWE. I'm sure you've, you've heard some of that. They're really going to do a nice send-off for him. That's going to be, got to be exciting for you to be able to see what, what that's well, going to look like for John. He's, he's earned it, and very few of us get to leave the business on our own uh, pace and our own, uh, time. Yeah. Yeah. Own terms. Yeah. And uh, he's getting to do that and he certainly has earned it. So very happy for him. We're going to, uh, we, as we have about 10 minutes left, a couple super chats, questions to get to, we're going to wrap up this show talking about the great American bash. It was in Dayton, Ohio, Arn. uh, Dayton, Ohio. It becomes a real WCW staple during this era. Any memories from you, Arm, working in Dayton at all? It's Father's Day, by the way, 1995. This show took place. And once again, we should have been at home with our children. Instead, we're working. Yeah. Right? Yeah. You know, but it's what we did, and there's no looking back. It's We did it for our own reasons and for the good of our family. It's just when you go back and review the history of, of your career, you go, mm. Sure wish that was one that I could have been home for or one of the kids' birthdays or your wife's birthday. Or You look at it all different now, don't you? Yeah. I mean, because you never get that back. And I'm 66 now and feeling it big time. It's, uh, it's time you never get back and uh, you never will get it back. And as, you know, the more is the light, you know, the years click by, it's like – man, this needs to slow down. Time's about up. Especially when you realize you gave up Father's Day to do a nine-minute match with the Renegade. Oh, I hate your guts. <laughs> that really is the kick in the gut. <laughs> Why don't you take a 10-penny nail and a hammer and stick it up under my nose and just, just hammer it, up it in. Just drive it into my brain. You're like saying how you regretted it. And I'm like, yeah. And then you had to wrestle that guy for nine minutes. Oh man. Oh, I love doing oh, the show that here. really put it in perspective. <laughs> 6,000 in attendance. It earned a live sellout. So you, you, well, I guess you were on a set paycheck. So I guess the live attendance and if it sold out, didn't mean too much. Uh, like no. That was okay. good and bad. You yeah. still got paid what your contract was, and that yeah. was a good thing. Yeah, yeah. Didn't mean, but if you were there or not, you still would have gotten paid, to your point. But uh, we have a lot of fun, as I mentioned. You just won't let it go, will you? I won't. I'm, I'm just being a jerk. You're on a now. roll. I know. I talked about it. They announced it here at this event. Steel Cage, Bash at the Beach, July. You and I are going to cover it. First show in December. We're going to tell that Paul Orndorff story, too. And we're going to have a lot of fun, but they do announce it there. It's funny because Nick Bockwinkle comes out at some point. Guys, watch the show. <clears throat> Looks at Tony Schiavone while he's cutting the promo. And they're going to get it, and they're going to fight in a steel cage at the uh, – What's the next event? And he looks at Shivani, and Shivani's like back to the <laughs> beach. And Shivani shoots Bobby the Brain Heenan the look, who's standing behind Bachwinkle. Heenan's hid, and Shivani and ba and Heenan are just smirking at each other because Bachwinkle couldn't remember that it's Bash at the <laughs> beach. I feel for Bachwinkle. Damn, I've been there sitting in front of these lights and forgetting shit. So I understand it happens. He just went blank. Poor Nick Bachwinkle went blank right there on the air. So. And it happens to me all the time, so I will not pile on. Yeah, yeah, you you understand. Let's talk about Bader because he drops the word shit live on the air. Turner definitely wouldn't have loved that. He says shit on the air again. You don't think that was a Turner was fond of that, was he? Oh, I'm sure that was a standards and practice. That's yeah, no, no. That's a I mean, no no. That's 95. This is way before the attitude. This is not attitude error or any of that stuff. The only yeah. thing you could sneak in and you had to be very clever about it was hell. 
Uh, right. Yeah. But even back then, like that hell but or damn or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. They didn't like it. They stayed away from that. And it would not behoove you to do that. You had uh, Brian Pillman and Alex Wright opening the show. Shivani's going on about how these two were so similar. And Heenan jumps in. Yeah, they're so similar. They're both punks. Heenan is classic on the mic, guys. Again, if you haven't seen the show, you should watch it. It's hilarious. But they're going back and forth. Headsets are takeover, drop kicks, everything you would expect in a Brian Pillman, Alex Wright uh, match. Great match. You have Harlem Heat. They win a tag match over some veterans. Dick Slater and Bunkhouse Buck. Um, so you got Sherry in Harlem Heat's corner, Colonel Parker there. Sherry beforehand had slapped the taste out of uh, Colonel Parker's mouth in like a pre-match, pre-show interview. That was entertaining. One thing that's not mentioned here is there was an arm wrestling match on the paper on the pay-per-view. DDP with the Diamond Doll, uh, Kimberly Page, who I was always a fan of in those days, did an arm wrestling contest. And uh, he lost to Dave Sullivan, who was going by Evad, and that's Dave spelled backwards. Uh, so they did that as like kind of the gimmick in between the Pillman, Pillman and Harlem Heat match. I don't know. It's just what they were doing back then. Uh, you had the Nasty Boys defending their tag titles against the Blue Bloods. Sir, the, 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 you had Stephen Regal and Bobby Eaton. He wasn't going by Bobby Eaton. He was the Earl of Eaton. The Earl of Eaton. The Earl of Eaton. And and during the promo with Oakland, he was staring off into space with his arrogant and the Earl of Eaton. And at one point, while Regal, who did all the talking, you see Mean Gene Oakland just look at Eaton and just start staring off to see where Eaton's looking off to. It was hysterical. Mean Gene's awesome. No words needed from Mean Gene. He was just no. that entertaining. It was it was so good. So we have that you, we talked about it, lose the TV title to the Renegade in nine minutes. Sting defeats Meng for the U.S. title. Ric Flair would defeat Randy Savage after hitting Angelo Poffo and stealing his cane. He hits, he hits a Savage with the cane to get the win. But this was just the beginning of a year-long feud. So this wasn't a this wasn't a match where it was like, hey, this is going to wrap up Flair and Macho. This is just to prolong a nice feud between these two guys. So he took Poffo's cane, smacks Savage with it when the ref's not looking, gets the pin, and that's how we end the show. Um, not every pay per view has to have that clean ending, does it? It can be a continuation of a story. I was just fixing to say, so if you're, especially if you're building to a show that's going to be within the next couple months, you can, you can certainly leave with heat occasionally. You don't always have to leave with the audience being happy if you're close together. Now, if you're going to be six months apart before the next show, it doesn't do you any good to leave with heat. Nobody remembers. Arn, one question I have for you before I go to the Super Chats and then wrap up. Can you talk about the chemistry Ric Flair and Randy Savage had together in so much, too? Because they did. They tore the house down. You believed that one segment, they both got themselves disqualified from this U.S. tournament because they were counted out. They're fighting each other through the parking lot. They're automatically disqualified from the tournament. Um, this was on a, a Saturday night show or a main event show. Uh, the brutal hatred that they were able to show each other. You have one guy who calls it in the ring in the Nature Boy, one guy who's Mr. Scripted and and Macho Man. But man, when they came together, it was electricity, wasn't it? Oh yeah. Well, there were two veterans that knew that slugging it out was going to draw more money than working high spots. Some guys could just brawl. You know, Randy Savage was a brawler. He wasn't a you know, one of these guys that, that does a, goes up top and does a moonsault off to the floor. You never saw that out of Randy. Now he would come over the top rope, come down with a double axe handle or something flashy for that time, but safe. And, you know, flare style, get them out in the audience and start the chops. And they can hear them. They can feel them. They can see oh, the right. hand print on the chest. That makes it, it brings it right into your living room. 
if you bought a ticket to have those two guys out there slugging it out. The intensity, uh, for sure, the realism, the, the, they had it all. And uh, one of the great feuds, underrated feuds, I would say, Macho and, and Nate. They had it in the WWF. They had it in WCW. And I uh, really enjoyed it. We have two Super Chats on. Anybody else have one more or two more they want to throw in Super Chat? We'll get to them. And then we'll close it down. Our buddy Albert says, <clears throat> May 1st, 2003 was the, fan, the day fans everywhere had our heartbroken, by the way. Um, talking about Liz. By the way, I agree with JR. Luger was unjustly blamed by the fans. Liz was an adult and made a choice. And so talking about Liz's passing. Um, but yes, 2003. Can you believe we are in 2024? Over 21 years ago, uh, we lost Miss Elizabeth. It just blows my mind that it's, time flies. Uh, it's incredible. Yeah, all you can say is what a tragedy. And there's no blame, I don't think. It's yeah. It's just it's more about the loss and the terrible, terrible loss that, that the world had, not just wrestling, because she was a very nice lady. Very nice, for sure. Uh David Van Boglin is next. He says, Arn and Paulie, my guys, I'm still hanging in there. Three surgeries in three months. Awesome. Pulling through. Hope you guys are doing fantastic, David. It's so nice to hear from you. And you are one of the most positive guys that I've heard that, that I even know, especially going through what you go through. It's incredible. Much respect, my friend. You're a tough son of a gun. Much respect. Yeah, well said. Uh, we have another super chat, and it's from an Instagram, a wrestling historian. He said, the rene Renegade match is the epitome of Arn Anderson being a professional. He could have refused to lose to an unworthy opponent like some top guys have, and he makes a great point. There's been some that would have said, no way. Uh, Arn, you were always a consummate businessman and professional. Well, uh, number one, I didn't know you could say no. Be honest with you. Uh, yeah. but I appreciate it. I knew that my job was there to have the very best match I could for the fans and do the best I could with my opponent and the skill set that he had. That's all you can do. Arn, I want to, uh, first of all, I want to thank, uh, Andrew Hermes for all the great research for this episode. You continue to crush it for us week in and week out. And I appreciate you, big red. You can catch him on Medusa's podcast. He's the producer and co-host of that show. Uh, also we're appreciative of the Dominic, of Dominic and Marcus D'Angelo, all the help that they do for this show behind the scenes. Arn, as we start to get out of here, one more reminder, you can check us out one T sport or one true sport.com for all your merch needs. You can get hoodies and sweatshirts. We're getting into that season, the horseman jackets and uh, all that great stuff. Also, make sure you go take advantage of C. Arn and Brock and get your hands on their comics, on the Arn comic. Arn Anderson, My Life is the Enforcer. Also, the fi action figure. There's so much fun stuff to come with Arn Anderson that's still in the works that we'll be able to talk about as episodes happen. I've mentioned before the Ultra Pro Wrestling game from Hyper Focus Games. It's coming in 2025. Hopefully, you're following them at UPW Video Game. Uh, they also have a Patreon page. Uh, Arn's a playable, downloadable character on that coming next year on all your game stations. But, Arn, I just want to thank you so much uh, for another fantastic show. In two weeks, November 19th, prior to us getting into the fun, you know, Thanksgiving and all that good stuff. Tuesday the 19th, we are going to do our favorite here, Ask Arn Almost Anything, where all of you, we just go through and answer all your questions and get to talk to the enforcer again around that virtual living room. Uh, Arn, I'm looking forward to that one. I always do. As do I, because the fans apparently are like you. They love it. So let's give them what they love, my friend. Let's give the people what they want. Guys, I can't, and girls, I can't thank you enough for being here with us tonight. I had an excellent time with all of you, and uh, we're going to get as many questions as we can in two weeks. Again, 6 p.m. Eastern, November the 19th. Join us live here on YouTube, that virtual living room. On behalf of the enforcer, Arn Anderson, this is Paul Bromwell, and we'll see you next time in two weeks right here on Arn.